Okay, so we're looking at biomedical applications of microbes. And there's basically two main applications, both involve ultrasound. One is molecular imaging, and the idea here is that we're going to use bubbles to image the physiology of the tissue. Okay? Food is not invasive. And the second is drug delivery. So we'll cover this first, then we'll cover drug delivery. And this is an old slide from the very first time I, I taught a course on this subject uh, of drug delivery. And in general, it's, it's sort of biomedical engineering, or more specifically, uh, microbubble engineering. And the idea is that you have synthetic chemistry, and most of us are not synthetic chemists, right? So we tend to ask our colleagues to provide us molecules that we can work with. But when they do that, then our job is to form an engineer. Right? And then we must characterize the formulation. Okay, so we characterize it by concentration, size distribution, stability, and so forth. At characterization, there's usually a feedback into the formulation, right? The bubble concentration is it, is it stable, the size distribution is too far dispersed, it needs to be more well dispersed, it needs to be shifted, etc. Okay? So there's always a feedback with the formulation. But if this is successful, if you've got the correct property characteristics of the microbubble, then you want to test, start testing its performance. And usually we start what we call in vitro, which means in glass. And basically that means um, test tube type studies, right? So, but although they tend to be fewer in the test tubes and more experiments than they do in the microscope. And they typically involve cells and blood, okay? So cells, you want to see, um, is it uh, dangerous to your cells to add these bubbles? Does it, is there any toxicity? Is there any apoptosis of the cells? And the blood. We want to see how the, the, the bubbles mix with the blood. This is particularly important for any drug delivery vehicles. For example, my cells. My cells are assemblies of, of, uh, of surfactants, lipids, other kinds of surfactants. And I love the bubble, but they have no gas form. They just have they're just an assembly of lipids. And they've been often used to develop drug delivery vehicles as drug delivery vehicles deliver the drug, a hydrophobic drug. But the problem is when we put them in blood, they tend to disassemble. Right? And so you need to test your, your agent in the blood to make sure in the serum, full serum, complement the drug to make sure that uh, your agent is still stable and has the proper characteristics. And if not, you go back to formulation, right? But if it does, if you're successful here, then you move to in vivo studies. And typically, you use small animals like mice and rats. And you then move up the sort of animal genome to large animals before we get to humans. Uh, recently, I've, done, I've been participating in studies with, with dogs and canines. And these are studies that are in collaboration with veterinarians. And, um, you know, as you may be aware, there's no health insurance for animals, so most people with pet dogs can't really afford to have a therapy. So when you're doing a, a mouse man study, as they say, and you're translating the technology to humans, um, canines actually offer a nice model of this. They're, they're large like humans, they have, if it's cancer, for example, they have a spontaneous tumor, which is more like a human tumor than a xenograft tumor. House. And so they're good for that study. And it's a win win proposition because uh, the dog is getting a therapy now, and we incentivize the owner by helping to pay for the therapy. And so it's a win win proposition, and it helps provide a baseline study that motivates uh, phase one clinical trial to do. Okay? So you get through your in vivo studies, and there's another feedback to formulation because um, you never know how successful it'll be in people. Maybe it won't be successful. Maybe they won't circulate as large as one of Or maybe they circulate too long. Or what have you. It depends on the application, right? But if this is finally successful, then you move to do the clinical trials. And as chemical biomedical engineers, engineers, uh, we typically don't, we don't run these, right? The MDTH group don't use. 
Jesus or the living story of Jesus. But we often collaborate with them in, in, this, in this endeavor, but we're, we're sort of beyond our domain. This is kind of the heart of the world we work. So if you're interested in getting into this field, I recommend that you find ways to adapt these four areas into your lab. Uh, or have we have collaborators that are available that you can collaborate with, in particular for the biological studies. And uh, what you'll see is research is becoming increasingly interdisciplinary, where biological and medical researchers are providing these components, and, uh, and, and then you have a team that's working together on this. And I think that this is. Another, this is an important point, is a formulation is like this key step. It, it's what everything is about. You know, the synthetic chemistry can only go so far, but it's formulating the liquids for the physical problem that makes it a useful problem. And just again, to remind you, this is our, this is what we're engineering. A gas bottle with 10 microns of diameter, suspended in water, and coated with some kind of surfactant, it could be more polymer. So it could be lipid, it could be protein, it could be polymer, or it could be a combination of those. Now, in imaging, there are many different modalities. Okay? There is, the original is x-ray. Right? I mean, it is the x-ray of the arm, the hand, the arm. It's the first uh, really medical image. The problem with x-ray is it has ionizing radiation. And so it's potentially mutagenic or carcinogenic. So this is problematic. So we want to move it, uh, potentially move away from X-ray. Okay? And then we have other modalities like MRI. MRI involves a magnet that aligns the proton spins of the hydrogen atoms. And then there are radio frequency waves that disrupt the alignments. And then you listen to the radio frequency waves that are emitted by the sample as those protons realign with the magnet. Okay? So it's really Beautiful physical, you know, in terms of physics, modality. But the problem is it requires these very strong magnets and equipment. Um, and so and typically you have to have a room with the Faraday cage that eliminates and other RF lines and isolates the magnet and so forth. And they're quite expensive. So in US dollars, they're on the order of millions of dollars. And they're quite expensive for the patient. The patient has to go to the MRI to get scanned. It often takes several weeks to, um, to, to schedule an exam, and then it takes a couple of days later for the uh, radiologist to read the exam and so forth. So MRI is great, but it's expensive and it's not portable. So what's unique about ultrasound is it's inexpensive and it's portable. Unlike the other modalities, instead of using electromagnetic waves, X-rays are a form of electromagnetic waves. MRI uses RF waves, and then of course there's optical imaging, but they all use electromagnetic waves. Ultrasound is unique in that it uses mechanical waves. Okay? So it's, it's still wave physics, but the propagation of the waves is a little bit different. Actually, it's more complex. Okay. So we talked about this before. Ultrasound often utilizes longitudinal waves. There are a few applications where ultrasound uses shear waves, for example, in elastography. But um, as part of the bubbles, we don't really use that. So mainly we're using longitudinal waves in a, in a technique that's called pulse echo, where a pulse is submitted and sent into the, the, the subject, and then it gets reflected and scattered back to the transducer. And it's re those reflections and scattered, events back scattered echoes are red and then used to create the image. But just recall that it's a longitudinal wave. The, uh, the material inside the medium is moving in a direction that's parallel to the propagation of the wave. And the wave is propagating, but not the matter. It's not a mass transport phenomenon. Instead, it's uh, with the slight movements in the molecular uh, density, but it's essentially a, a momentum wave that's propagating through the medium. And at the frequencies that are used for ultrasound imaging in the clinic, megahertz, one to 10 megahertz frequency, and because of the speed of 
the sound in each of these. The wavelength tends to be on the order of 100 microns to 1 millimeter. The micron, the micro bubble being less than 10 microns, is one to two orders of small than that wave. So it feels the isotropic pressure field that increases in pressure and decreases with pressure as a function of time and causes the micro bubble to volumetrically oscillate. Again, this is a rhythm cassette simulation of micro bubble oscillation. So one micron diameter, two megahertz frequency. 100 kilopascal equal to pressure over five microseconds. But see how the bubble is expanding and contracting? It's those volumetric oscillations that provide the most sound contrast. Because as those volumetric oscillations are, are happening, they're pulling water in and pushing water out, and that's creating spherical rings that then travel back to the transducer at the speed of sound. And so the speed of sound is actually about, the tissue is about 1,500 meters per second. So it's quite fast. Um, and so these, these waves are detected by the old sound transducer. So, recent advances in ultrasound imaging. This is a letter that was uh, just a couple of years ago that came out, and it's made quite a stir in the ultrasound imaging community. In fact, there were a number of groups that had been working on um, this technique, but really this was this was the first one to make it to the prime time and be published in nature. And it's, the, it's, a, it's work that's by the French group, the Institut de Rangelon in Paris, and uh, particularly led by Mikhail Cantor, Olivier Couture, and um, the Claudia Mirador did this study. The title of it is Ultrafast Ultrasound Localization Microscopy for Deep Super Resolution Vascular Imaging. And this key word is a key word here localization. Localization means you're trying to find out where something is, right? Well, guess what they're trying to find out? Guess what they're trying to find? Guess what they're trying to localize? Anybody want to guess? Microbubbles. They're trying to localize the microbubble echoes. Right? So they use a technique to localize the bubbles by virtue of ultrasound. And the bubbles are moving through the vasculature. So by localizing the microbubbles, they localize the vasculature. And what they do is they sh completely shatter the what used to be the limits of spatial resolution in ultrasound. The spatial resolution by diffraction was limited to about the wavelength of the ultrasound, which as I said was about 100 microns to a millimeter. They completely shattered this with this technique. They're getting a resolution on the order of 10 microns. So that's two to three orders of magnitude smaller than what was previously possible. Here's another word that's key, D. You can get that kind of resolution with optical microscopy, but you can't penetrate into tissue with optical microscopy more than a, a millimeter with ballistic run because of reflection and scattering and absorption of the light. Optical light, sorry. So therefore, you can get a little bit deeper, but you're still not moving down beyond, much beyond a millimeter or so. So, um, what this allows you to do is get on the order of centimeters, which is quite extraordinary. What they did is they basically localized these bubbles, okay, the bubble echoes, and they tracked then those bubble echoes. And by, by tracking the where, pointing out where the bubble is, and then making that pixel red, okay, and then over time, you start to fill in where all the bubbles are flowing as they're circulating through the vasculature, as they're circulating through the brain. This is the top of the brain of a mouse. You can start to visualize the, the vasculature. So you can see microvesicles in the, the top part of the cortex of the brain of a mouse. That's the brain of a mouse. 
you've ever seen the brain of a mouse, it's really, really small. This is extraordinary resolution. That's a 500 micron scale bar. This used to be the limit of resolution. And now we're seeing structures that are much, that are much, much beyond that resolution. Uh, you can see quite deep uh, imaging, right? This is one millimeter. This, this is what stops ballistic light, optical microscopy. But here they're imaging tens of millimeters down uh, in the brain of the mouse. These are different uh, slices of images. You can simply translate the acoustic stage, the, the acoustic probe, and you can do different slices of the images. So the bubbles are also moving, and via this localization technique, we can determine how fast the bubbles are moving in what direction. So not only can they determine the anatomy of the vessels, but they can also have the functional information on the flow. Which vessels are, are arterial, which vessels are venous, what are the relative flow rates. In this beautiful paper, they were able to, to look at, to zoom in on, on individual vessels, and they're able to get the, the parabolic velocity profile and expect the flow to you know, Mouse, or a tiny microcosm of mouse. So it's extraordinary technique. Okay? And this used uh, really simplistic bubbles. Okay? So if we can better engineer microbubbles, then this, these techniques will be moved even to the next level. Okay? But these are the types of images. Again, this is it's really important to point out this is a brain of mouse. Okay? Now, one of the things is that uh, in this experiment, they had to uh, move the scroll of the mouse so that the paper could be imaging. And they need to do that because the signal is noise ratio. So if we can make bubbles that are stronger scatterers, then uh, they'll have enough signal to noise ratio and we'll be able to, uh, to, to take advantage of this technique with the effects. Currently, it's believed, I think, in the, throughout the general ultrasound community that you can't image through the skull and get images like this, particularly in human, which obviously has a thicker skull than the nose. But I think it's just a matter of time. I think if we are able to generate better bubbles that have resonant frequencies that are nice um, and tuned to the frequency of the, of the acoustic probe, that maybe this might be possible. So I would say there will be a bubble. Okay, so. With that, I'll show you some preliminary attempts that my lab has made to try to engineer bubbles to a better image. Okay. And so we're looking here in particular small animal imaging. So we have a mouse, uh, and the mouse is sitting on a, uh, on a stage, and we're imaging it with a high frequency uh, ultrasound scanner. This was the old Evo, Evo 770. Had a little, uh, a little arm with a transducer at the end and two back and forth. Okay, the new Vivos, not so new, this was uh, from 2010, but about 2010, uh, 2008 or something like that. Vivo saw this in the case. This also came out with a video right for the operators at 45 megahertz. This one operated at 40 megahertz. And the mouse is sitting here, it's being anesthetized, so it can give it some isocarin and oxygen as a carrier gas. And then there's a tail vein injection that's done by uh, using, inserting a cannula into the tail vein of the mouse. This is really, you know, a lot of the difficult part of the imaging study. The mouse has uh, a pretty small vein in its tail, and you have to use a larger needle, right? A, a, high, a lower gauge needle or, or a larger needle. Because if the needle's too small, then you get this back pressure to kind of push the bubbles through. And there's a lot of shear gradients within the flow, and that tends to degrade the bubbles. So you, you have this problem where you have to have a, a catheter, maybe like a 27 gauge catheter or, or lower, and you're trying to stick it in this really small vein. It takes a year to use. So 
this is this is something that my my recommendation is if you go into animal studies that just go and get trained on this. Find somebody who knows how to do this and spend a day or two to get trained on it. It's going to take a while to get used to it. You don't want to you don't want to wait until you you have a tumor here in your for example, to start working on this. You want to work on this um, if you want to do some practice on it before you get into your expensive area. And in this study, 100, micro 100 microliters are injected. Now, these animal studies, um, you can only inject, I think, up to 150 uh, microliters before you start to overburden the, the volume of the blood of the mouse. Okay? So there's a limit to how much you can inject. And so we injected 100 microliters of suspension, followed by 50 microliters to just clear out the tumor and make sure we push all the microliters into the circulation. Delivered by the tail ring. And these bubbles, uh, we tested some different concentrations, 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 9 bubbles per hour. This shows the scattering, absorption, and extinction cross sections that are theoretical as a function of the microbial diameter at 40 megahertz driving frequency, which is what we're using for these small animals. And what you notice, let's look at the green, the scattering coefficient, and then notice this is a log scale. So the scattering coefficient doesn't really kick in to about, until about one micron. And then it increases pretty significantly, and really that's a log scale, that's the total disclosure. But because there's some, at, at 40 megahertz, these some micron bubbles are now in resonance getting a lot of absorption of that crystallization. Okay. So remember that bubbles can oscillate and re-radiate acoustic energy, but that's only one dissipation form. There's, there's heat transfer, there's uh, viscous dissipation, there's shell dissipation, and so on. There's other mechanisms by which bubbles can attenuate the ultrasound. And so that all leads to absorption. So notice that absorption is quite high. And then as you move away from residence, the absorption comes down, and the scattering takes over. Well, guess what you want for ultrasound imaging? Do you want absorption? No, right? You can't, you can't image absorption. You can image scat backscattering. So that's what we want, right? So we want, if you look at this, it tells you we want bubbles where scattering is dominant. So maybe you know, at least greater than two, but maybe not here to three, four microns of volume. So, in the, I'm showing you this up front. We actually created this plot after a discussion with Peter Flinken at Bradville after we did the study to try to explain, we were trying to explain our results, but I'm showing you up front. It's often the way that uh, science works. You come in with a hypothesis, you get a result that you don't expect, even if it does repeat or not your hypothesis, but you get something unexpected, and then you go back and you try to find out what it is. And then when you present your work to an audience, you always pretend that you know what you were doing in the first place. So this is a uh, polydispersed microbial suspension. You've all made polydispersed microbial suspensions. And uh, it's injected into the bubble, this is the mouse, uh, this is the kidney of the mouse. Uh, Imaging the kidney of a mouse or a rat or a dog is, is a great way to image the persistence of the bubble and the scattering of the bubble because it's a highly perfused organ. A lot of the cardio output, cardiac output of blood goes through the kidney. So it's highly perfused and it lights up like a Christmas tree when you uh, when you inject bubbles. And So see what happens here? You get a lot of attenuation. The mean signal intensity increases but decreases, and you lose most of the signal by about two or three minutes. These are one to two micron bubbles. So uh, this is just the grayscale, and this is the contrast. Um, I don't know if you can 
can see it, but the green, the green are the are just the colors. So this is subtraction that's done in the grayscale with the images that we take before bubbles were ejected. And then the subtraction is done, the image with the bubble minus the image without the bubble to determine the color vectors. So you can see nicely there's two big vessels here. You can tell that they're dark because blood doesn't scatter very efficiently through the tissue. But then when bubbles come in, they scatter. So you can see them with the color. But you can see a lot of green throughout the tissue. So it's not working great as a contrast. Here's four to five microns. First of all, you see a lot of speckling in the ejector. You see a lot of green throughout the tube. So these are very epigenetic. Another two microns, four to five microns, six to eight microns. Just individual snapshots. You can see a lot more contrast going on in these larger bubble populations. A lot less scattering going on here, even potentially more um, attenuation. So these are the one to two micron bubbles, and there's two regions of interest that we draw. One is around the entire cranium, that's in green. If you draw that region of interest and you look at the mean to medium intensity from the contrast, it actually decreases and then comes back. That's because of attenuation. So instead of looking at the whole thing, you just look at the top part, just to look for maybe some scattering at the top part. And we see a slight increase in the signal. With the noise, it's hard to tell whether there's truly an increase. Imagine an average of about uh, uh, that's, uh, you know, it takes some imagination. So obviously these, these are not working so well. But if you look at the time intensity plots for the other agents, four to five microns and six to eight microns, you get a nice increase in the intensity. The four to five micron bubbles last longer than the four to twos, and the six to eights last longer than the four to fives. The bigger bubbles are circulating longer and provide more contrast. Remember that issue I talked about, signal to noise ratio? And it turns out that all the first bubbles mainly comprise one or two microns. Okay. That's the bulk. If you remember when we did the culture counter, sub two microns, that was where the big peak was. So it turns out that these bigger bubbles are much better, at least at this frequency, to provide the contrast. This is the maximum change of video intensity as a function of bubble concentration in microbubbles per milliliter ejected. Ranging from 1 times 10 to 7 to 1 times 10 to the time, so two orders of magnitude. And with the 6 to 8 microns, you see a nice increase. 4 to 5 microns, you see a nice increase. You don't have 6 to 8 at this higher concentration because what happens is they become quite concentrated. They're big bubbles, and at that number, we start to get the volume fraction. That leads to um, more the changes in the viscosity of the fluid, it's going to be more like a higher viscosity. Um, and then one to two microns, you know, basically not much contrast at the higher concentrations, they're actually getting negative contrast. <laughs> Again, recall that that's the number one, that, that, that the large proportion of the contrast measurements are this size. This is contrast persistence, the lifetime of those. And in particular, um, so how long the bubbles are circulating. And again, versus microbubble concentration, number of microbubbles per milliliter, again ranging from 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 9 microbubbles per milliliter. And the 6 to 8 microns provide a pretty significant and steady contrast of about 5 minutes. At the high concentration, they go all the way up to 15 minutes. Which in a mouse, that's a long time. That's a long period for um, circulation. For a long circulating bubbles. Four to five micron bubbles also do pretty well. They circulate, um, you can see the increase in circulation time, the, the concentration that are injected, as you would expect, and also one to two micron bubbles. It's kind of interesting that four to fives, in this case, don't last much longer than one to twos, but they do in this case. So, again, the data is saying, 
the larger bubbles are better. Not only do they provide a higher amount of contrast, but they're also a circular in the world. They provide a more consistent contrast. In contrast against ultrasound humans, this is problematic because the contrast region only circulates for about five minutes. And if you're doing more than five minute observation, then you have to do a second pulse. You have to interrupt the study to do a second pulse injection. Question. Uh, do it mean that uh, by increasing this uh, diameter, there will be problems like the uh, for the circulation, like the diameter, average diameter of the channel will be like around three or four micron. So we uh, we like when uh, it's a, uh, doing this kind of experiment, do you consider that type of? I think the bulk the diameter of the of the, uh, the, the capillaries is a little bit larger than that. I think it's more like five or six microns. Uh, in mice, it can be quite small, but uh, I think the average diameter is a bit larger. But nonetheless, the larger bubbles don't appear to be causing any kind of problems like that. Now, they are deformable. They're bubbles, they can deform. Uh, there has been some studies with intravitamine microscopy to see what happens with bubbles. And bubbles that are too large, large bubbles are injected intraarterially, in particular in this study, we did intraarterial injections, so you get larger bubbles past the capillary bed and image it intravital. Um, and they saw basically the bubble would enter the, the small vessel and then it would, it would elongate and shrink a little bit and then it would go downstream. And so there's a physiological process, it's like it's called neutrophil forming. So cells do this too. Cells are large compared to the diameters of the vessel sometimes too. And then if they clog flow, they just deform the endoskeleton The bubbles aren't smart like that, but they just deform uh, according to blood flow. So, yeah, these bubbles, we haven't seen any adverse reactions with these bubbles. Just by injection. Yes. Yeah, I'll talk about immune clearance um, in particular tomorrow during. But, but yeah, that's one of the ways that bubbles get, uh, get, get uh, taken down in circulation. They, they get uh, phagocytosed by the white cells that are in circulation and also resident macrophages and uh, infracells cells in the brain. So they, get, they do get taken up. And the, the kind of coating you use will impact how well they retain the time. So I'll talk about that more depth tomorrow when we talk about lack of compatibility. But yeah, there's there's a new response with anything you inject into your body, and so there's a potential for a new response. So, I mean, this is the smart thing about our, our biology is we, we have uh, defenses against pathogens and particles that enter into our bloodstream. So you have to find ways to try to evade that long enough to have those therapeutic or imaging effective relations. Good questions, good comments. Anything else? Um, so, you can also look at that time intensity curve, and then you can integrate the area of the curve to get a sense of the total dose of con in this case, ultrasound contrast. So, that's called the area of the curve. Again, the plotting it versus microbial concentration from 10 to 7 to 10 to 9. And we see that you get an increase. For all the ages, you get an increase in the area of the curve, except for the small ones, because they have a negative contrast, you see the area of the curve becomes less than usual. And that's what we expect, right? We increase the number of balls, we increase more contrast, we expect more contrast. But what's amazing is just this huge increase that we see for 16 microns. And it really is um, order of magnitude larger than the ages. It's quite extraordinary. Okay, so that's an initial study that we did. Okay, so we had the ability to make bubbles and do size selection. So we wanted to just see how does that impact bubble circulation. It obviously makes a big impact. Um, in the study I'm going to show next, um, we're going to use four to five microns. Why four to five? Because four to five microns give us a nice contrast on one hand, and um, they're, they're sort of economical to make. Okay, so with the bubble methods of with the methods of production of synthesis that we use in sonication and so forth, 
we tend to make, we get a lot, you know, most of the bubbles are one to two microns, but they're not good for our application. Four to five microns are quite abundant, six to eight microns are much less abundant, right? So ideally, I guess we could go to six to eight microns, but those four to fives are more abundant, and the student has to spend less time in the lab doing size selections, and we, we you know, you take the infernate to the size selection, use that to generate more bubbles, and go back to the size selection and so forth, and we do that until you build up enough bubbles for your, for your study. So the four to fives are a lot easier to make in this process. So we just study the four to fives. And uh, so the principle behind the ultrasound molecular imaging is uh, you have a circulatory system and you do an injection of party bubbles, a bolus or an infusion injection, into the, into the, uh, into the vein of the subject. And once it gets into the vein, it goes to the heart, it goes to the lungs, it goes back to the heart, and then gets distributed throughout the body uh, through the arterial network, and recirculates back to the venous network and then continues to circulate until the contrast becomes is, is eliminated. And you, so the bubbles are in the vasculature, and then you focus the ultrasound probe, or you place the ultrasound probe over a tissue that you're interested in imaging. In this case, I'll show the kidney, but it could be anywhere in particular in the abdominal region, it could be through an acoustic window, through the ribs to see the heart, etc. So it could be anywhere in the body where you can use ultrasound images. And so the scales are the, the human beings on the scale of meters, the ultrasound waves are on the order of millimeters, but the blood vessels are on the order of micrometers, if I show it in those earlier pictures. So the bubbles are circulating in, their, in, in these microvessels, and the ultrasound waves are, are impinging on these bubbles that are, are oscillating and, and, uh, and imaging those bubbles. But we, we, what we want to do is ultrasound molecular imaging. So what we want to do is we have target receptors on the cells of the vessels that we're trying to bind to. So the bubble has ligands. And the cell, the target cells, the target microphone has receptors, and we need a ligand receptor interaction, a lot to keep binding, right? Um, to facilitate adhesion of the bubble to the endothelium so we can imitate. Right? So um, the bubbles have multiple ligands, the cells have multiple receptors, so it's actually a multiple ligand receptor interaction where you have multiple ligand receptor interactions in parallel that are. Uh, Giving firm adhesion of the bubble even in hypothermic flow. And the rest of the bubble at that stage, at that, at that vasculature, tells us that that receptor is present. So, typical receptors that we might, well, physiological processes that we might be interested in imaging at the vascular level are inflammation. Inflammation is a key player in. Physiology of disease and healing. Okay, so it's often interesting to image inflammation. For example, one of the hottest areas uh, in, in cancer therapy is immunotherapy, where you're trying to train your own immune system to identify the cancer as the enemy so that your own immune system will attack it. Really, I mean, can you imagine a better therapy than that? That's the best possible therapy. It's been it's worked phenomenally well for like one foreign cancer, but it hasn't worked. It's still being developed for solid tumors. But one of the things you want to know is if it's working or not. So you need to be able to image the inflammatory state of the vasculature within the tumor in order to do that. Another one is uh, angiogenesis. So tumors that are becoming malignant. Um, and are going to metastasize, tend to initiate what we call the novo angiogenesis, or they're trying to initiate angiogenesis. That is, feeding, creating new blood vessels that feed into the tumor. And it's a physiologic process that the vasculature goes through. And there are certain receptors that you can target that, um, that you can target to, to see if there are new vessels, if there is active angiogenesis happening in the tumor. So this is, these are the two examples of physiological processes that you might want to uh, do. So this is the way that 
um, ultrasound molecular imaging, a typical ultrasound molecular imaging protocol. And on the y-axis is acoustic intensity. Again, you can do acoustic intensity in units of decibel or dB. And then on the y-axis, or the x-axis, is time in minutes. So these are the, like the time intensity curves that I showed you before. And they're formed by drawing what's called a region of interest, just drawing a, a, a shape, an area in your image, and then looking at the contrast intensity, basically determining the contrast intensity within that region of interest at each time point and apply that. Right? So if you do that, then when you do the bubble injection, you get this increase in contrast acoustic intensity. And then it peaks out at some point, and then it starts to decay because the contrast of it has been removed from the circulation. Um, at the same time, you're getting binding of bubbles. So you're getting, you have a circulating agent okay, that's getting cleared from the, from the body, and then you have your total contrast, which includes both bound or adherent contra bubbles and freely circulating ones. So it's really important to be able to distinguish these two. One is one of these just for retarded levels, right? So, so what we do is after a sufficient amount of time, in this, in this particular case it's a five minute dwell time, we do some images of the, of the regions, contrast against images. And this is like a tumor, this is actually a tumor model of atrial plug. With a glass factor that's inducing it to administer. And you can see that a large amount of contrast initially. Okay, so that's this point. You grab a bunch of those images, okay, and then you send in a higher power pulse that fragments and destroys all the bubbles. It destroys the freely circulating bubbles and the bound bubbles. Okay. And so when you do that, then you get reflow in a of freely circulating bubbles that diffuse back into the tissue. And so that's this here. Okay? So you grab some post burst images, okay, and you collect those images. Then you do a subtraction. So you have pre burst image here, you have post burst image here, you subtract them, that gives you your bound bubbles. And so then you, you can apply a color scheme and you've got your bubbles. Everybody follow that? That's how a typical ultrasound molecular imaging sequence is done. Does that make sense to anyone? You understand that we'd have to uh, we'd have to differentiate between freely circulating bubbles and adherent bubbles, and we can simply do this by by doing a subtraction. It's cool that we can do this with our contrast. We can completely eliminate the contrast and allow freely circulating bubbles to come in to provide that ability to do that subtraction. It's unique to bubbles, right? There's no sort of analogy in an MRI or CT where you can suddenly uh, remove the contrast in the region. You just have to wait for the body to remove it. And in vivo, in situ, you can change this. You can change the contrast. This shows some example of, uh, of, of the protocol that I just showed. So there's a pre image. Here, the pre burst images are here. The, the, the intensity for pre burst images are here. And then the burst image is, is at this red line, or the burst pulse is at that red line. And then you wait some time, and there's a reflow of, of freely circulating bubbles. And you can see it's kind of following this, this trend, this increasing trend. This is a control bubble, it's a control bubble, it's not targeted, it has no ligand on the surface. So it's supposed to just continue to perfuse. Your tissue is not supposed to appear and that's what you see. Whereas the targeted bubbles, there's uh, a more steady contrast before the burst and then after the burst, you can see it drop in the contrast in freely circulating bubbles. And so there's a big difference between this and this. And so that would tell us that we were successful with targeting the vascular. And in this case, we're targeting the we're talking, we have we're injecting bubbles that are targeted against angiogenesis, and we, we have a model where we know that it's activated angiogenesis because we're testing the technology. So we're seeing this proof of concept, and we're seeing what we expect to see. 
So we took this a step farther and said, okay, now we have the ability to measure angiogenesis. Maybe it's not quantitative, maybe it's still it's qualitative or semi-quantitative at this point, but we have some capability of identifying tumors which have active angiogenesis. So can we actually determine, can we actually see that in two different tumor models? Right? One model is SKM, and this is um, a Bell's tumor. And this is known to have active angiogenesis. And then when you add an anti-angiogenic agent, in this case, venicidinib, or Vastin, it's an anti-angiogenic antibody, and it's what they call VEGF blocking. It blocks the ability of VEGF, it binds to VEGF. VEGF is this vascular, vascular interfering with growth factor, so it's part of the angiogenesis mechanism. And so to block that, the idea is that you block angiogenesis and you can start the tumors. So this particular tumor model is a human from a human in the human model. Um, it's known to respond to the uh, to the therapy, to the devocidumab therapy. And so we, we do a molecular imaging scan with RGB, our levels that are actually targeted to angiogenesis. It's a small peptide, it's a three unit peptide. And RAD is a similar peptide, but it's, it doesn't bind to the, the receptor for angiogenesis. Right? So RGB binds, RAD does not bind. So we, our, our idea is like a, a control model. And why do we go through all this trouble of adding a peptide to a control model? Well, you have to be careful of non-specific interactions. Okay? Interactions that, you know, you have a peptide that could bind to other blood proteins, it could have electrostatic interactions or other kinds of non-specific, non non-ligand receptor interactions that lead to an adhering, and those will fake you out, and you're false positive, and make you think that the, the disease state is zero, is that it's not. So you have to always do a comparison um, between targeted and non-targeted. If you're using antibodies to target, you want to have an isotype control, an antibody that's of similar form, like an IgG or an IgA, um, but it's not targeted. It's not specific to the receptor that you're so here's the initial, we see a big uh, drop in the signal before the pulse and after the pulse, and we're getting a lot of binding, uh, indicating that there is active angiogenesis. And we see a little bit of a drop, but not much of a drop from the RAD. This is the non-specific interaction. And particularly with angiogenesis, you're getting new blood vessels that form, so these new little buds and incomplete vasculature, et cetera, that um, so bubbles can stick, and bubbles can find their ways in these little nooks and crannies of the little vessel of blood. Okay, so you're, you're going to have some non-specific uh, uptake and non-specific signal. So, um, so this allows by subtracting this, this from this, the RAD from the RGB, you're able to get specificity. So here it is initially before the administration of the Cinemab. This is one day later. It hasn't changed very much. But by three days, you can see that these are flat. So basically, the blood vessels are not angiogenic. Okay? And they respond. What's great is that you can tell within three days, here's five days, but you can tell within three days whether the therapy is working. And so this is great because it turns out that some patients respond very well to angiogenic therapy, while many do not. And you want to know very quickly whether the patient is responding to angiogenic therapy. Usually, right now, the status quo for imaging, for imaging to determine whether a therapy is working is to just look at the size of the tumor and whether the tumor shrinks or not. And that could take weeks or months. And during that time, you're still giving the patient the wrong therapy. So it is working. So you want to know. And it's also important that you have, let's say you have an anti-angiogenic drug or you know, immunotherapy. You want to know which patients it's going to work on. You want to be able to select out the patients 
going to have a high probability that this therapy is going to work, right? So that because you begin your, your approval process, you don't want to have a bunch of patients that it's never going to work on that dilute out the positive results. This happens so many times with drugs like that you know, pharmaceutical companies spend millions of dollars uh, making these drugs and putting them through clinical trials, and they work really great on a subset of patients, but there's all these other patients that don't work on them, so they fail in those clinical trials. So it's better to be able to pre-select. So there's good, good reasons for, for using this. We also tested on a non-responder. Um, this particular tumor is called AGP. It's a really insidious type of tumor. It's a neuroblastoma. And what it does is, instead of, instead of creating a tumor that creates its own new vessel growth, it, it, it uh, takes up vessels that are already present and grows around them. So it's really insidious type of tumor. It's, it's, and, uh, and it doesn't, it's not going to be responsive to VEGF because it never induces its own angiogenesis. It's the kind of tumor that, again, grows around a host of vasculature rather than building its own vasculature. And indeed, with, the, with this non-responder tumor, which does not have much de novo angiogenesis, you don't see it. You don't see it initially, and you don't see it for like and so this is really an indication that the technology is working. You can look at relative microbial perfusion. So this is how perfused the tumor is as a biomarker. And the fact of the matter is we don't really see much of a signal there, much of a signal change there. We're not seeing a good readout of us that, that the tumor is responding to therapy. So the tumor is not shrinking, and the tumor perfusion is not decreasing. So you would think that the therapy is not working. But in fact, it was working, and you can see that when you do the molecular imaging. So the perfusion is not changing, but with molecular imaging, this means that relative uh, target microbial perfusion is relative because we're subtracting the, the, the non-specific interaction from the R and D, right? So we just, this is a specific, specific interaction, and it's, it, it, it varies, but in all cases, by three days, it's down. So this is an indication that the therapy is working, whereas here we didn't have any indication that the therapy was working. Um, this is also important to continue doing this. So just because the therapy works initially, doesn't mean it's going to continue to work. Okay, the, the, you have to understand that cancer cells are living and they can respond uh, to drugs, and often they can build resistance to drugs. In this case, they can, they can change their pathway, they can renormalize the vasculature. And what's often seen with anti-angiogenic therapy is initially there's a response and then there's a rebound, and sometimes the tumor grows even faster than it did in the first place. And you want to know if and when that's happening so that you can immediately change the drug therapy to attack the tumor. There's no magic bullet for tumor therapy. It's a matter of managing the tumor growth, trying to restrict the growth and prevent growth of metastasis. And so you need you need to know when the tumor is is changing, so that you can change your therapeutic protocol. So that's another important point to focus on that. And of course, uh, NGP is a non-responder tumor. We just don't see it responding in your case. We also uh, did some mycoscopy, some histology and mycoscopy on the tumors and you see um, SKMF with the two responder tumor and you see a, a large drop. Interestingly, at one day it's already started to drop, the new vessels have started to drop. We didn't see a response to that day, we saw it by three days. But you can, and mycoscopy is happening at the same day. Whereas NGP, we don't see a response. But this is invasive, right? This is you're going in, you're taking the tumor out, you're perfusing it, and then you're, you're putting it in a section and you're putting it in a microphone. Um, if you have a tumor that's resectable, that's what you do. Right? You just take it out, you surgically remove it. But many of these tumors, 
these particular tumors that I'm showing you, they're, they're growing in, um, in the kidney. And they are growing in the blood in the kidney, and they can't be removed uh, easily because you actually get the flow vein or you kill the patient. And so many surgeons, in fact, will not do that kind of surgery. They call it another cell. Again, remember that you're seeing that drop in bubble in molecular imaging by day three. So in fact, some of them had dropped by day one, but there's still some 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 of these a couple of these tumors that are still up here, but everything has dropped by day three. So this is an example where we took um, the size selected bubbles that we used in in concert concert with ultrasound molecular imaging. And we're starting to see some physiological benefit, some benefit in the diagnosis and, and, and tracking responsibility. We also uh, wanted to make ultra stable bubbles. The idea here is that if your bubble is circular larger, they'll have more passes through the target vasculature and they're more likely to, to bind. Right? So, all, so more stable bubbles have multiple potential applications. Also, remember that image that I showed here at the beginning, the, the high resolution imaging of the mouse vasculature? That will also benefit from a longer circulation. So I showed you before we could, uh, we, we, could we could think about the bubble composition using these close grain methods, water, color carbon, and liquid, and then you can you can Assume a packing confirmation for the lipid. In this case, we assume that it is hexagonal packing. And that the lipids are lining up sort of perfectly next to each other. And we estimated the pair potential for the head group region and the tail group region. Just based interplay electrostatic forces, Coulomb potential, and dispersion interaction on the Jones. And then the total energy is of some of the head group and tail potential energies. We can differentiate those with respect to the interlocutor spacing to determine the force between the two molecules. We can then divide the force by the distance to determine the surface pressure. And we can differentiate the surface pressure with respect to the area to determine the elasticity. And the elasticity is seen to change as a function of the interlocutor space. And you can determine what the uh, ideal or, or the um, equilibrium interlocutor spacing is when by setting the forces equal to zero, that is the attractive and repulsive forces are balanced, and then you can find the elasticity of that. So we did this experiment with multiple bubbles, and we were basically forcing them to oscillate. And we tried some different chain lengths using this photo, photo uh, laser photoacoustics method. Again, we have optical absorption of a pulse laser that's provoked by a seeding of the gold nanoparticles that then dissipate that heat and leads to thermal expansion of the gold core that then causes the bubble to experience small amplitude oscillations, which we're detecting with this continuous wave laser. So here's the raw data. You can put that to a model and from that determine the resonant frequency and the band ratio. And the resonant frequency to be plotted for different bubbles as a function of the bubble radius and for different liquid shell types, C16, C18, C20, C22. They all fit very nicely in these curves. You see here, 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 and here. These elasticities um, for each individual bubble can be plotted. They form a nice normal distribution, and they give you um, elasticities on the order of 1 to 2 nanotubes per meter. Uh, 2.4 for the 3.3 uh, for the USBC, 3.9 for the USBC. Again, the data fits the model pretty well. I think you can probably account for thermal expansion with the kinetic energy of the molecules at high temperature. There's also the 
damping ratio. And remember we saw this in LSA where the, the DPPC, we see a drop in the last six weeks and an increase in the Okay, so the idea was, now well, we have these bubbles with different elasticities. Um, let's see if, if the bubble that's the stiffer bubble, that is the bubble that has a higher elasticity, could persist longer in circulation. So the first step we do, remember that diagram that I showed you, the paradigm of, of engineering the bubbles. First you do the characterization, in in vitro and in vivo. So what we're doing here characterization without any biological surface. Just looking at stability in saline. And so this is double count as a function of diameter for different time periods. And this is the concentration as a function of time. So initially these are uh, four to five micron bubbles. Uh, you can see it's not the best uh, separation of sweet like the ones we did. Uh, but but it, it has a nice but you can see here's at two minutes, 109 minutes, 64 minutes. You can see how the bubbles are creating. This is during um, constant concentration, uh, or just dilution, sorry, in the city. The concentration is being diluted to a million bubbles per ml. That's, what, that's how much they're diluted in a typical contrast interval injection of a human being. This is the concentration as a function of time. And C16 is pretty small, and it increases with C18, increases more with C20, more with C22. But for C24, it drops. Right? So we're actually seeing that C24 is less stable, even though it's a longer channel. It also gives in vitro ultrasound contrast persistence to see how long they persist with, under ultrasound. And Here's the PPC, it doesn't last very long in green. The SPC is red. The APC, is, so C18, C20 is yellow. C22 is red, is blue. And then C24, it drops again. Okay, it's back to about the same as the most common that we see. Then we went to the Evo. The ultrasound contrast persistence. So again, we look at the kidney of the mouse, and we look, this is the vivo image of the kidney. When you use contrast cards, so that all the tissue signal is being subtracted out because there's a linear response as well as a non-linear response. And these are the non-linear response of the bubbles. And you can see them here, and you draw that region of interest, and you, and you integrate the contrast as a function of time. And here it is again. So C is down here, the APC is green, it's right here, the SPC, the DPC, and then the LTC again drops. Okay, so that longer chain is again having the least uh, circulation resistance. So we're getting consistent results that longer chains are usually giving us more stability, but there's a limit, and then we actually lose stability. So we took these time intensity curves and we fit them to a single compartment quantum genetic model where you have a K, a kinetic rate in which they're entering the bloodstream, the initial concentration, and then K2 is an illumination rate. This shows some of the information. 38 microvolts per milliliter are injected at 150 microliters. We get a total of 1.5 times 77 microbubbles that are injected. And those bubbles were in the order of five, or by the size range of about 45 microns in diameter. So um, this value is not as important as this value. They all have about the same uh, rate of uptake because we're doing the bolus injection. So this what this does is you have a bolus injection in the tail vein and then it's coming to the heart and it's being redistributed. So you're looking at that rate which is being distributed through the body at the whole injection. And of course that shouldn't depend on the, the, the shell, right? That should, that, should, that should depend on how the injection works and the physiological state of the mouse, which is under the seizure in this case. Here's the, uh, the, the elimination. You can see that it's decreasing. The rate, the elimination rate is decreasing. That's a large scale. 
increasing good day for men, and good set for the other person. You can also run this model with the half life, so you can see the half life is increasing and then it drops. Again, that's a long scale. So half life increases and then drops. So there, you see a pretty big increase from UPC to SPC, and we attribute that to this difference in shell rigidity okay, between UPC and SPC. This similar type of increase you can see. Remember, Dennis Gibbs' work in UPC was had, had no registered surface viscosity with the SPC green. Also, with this, this dissolving bubbles for deep UPC, you see them in the spherical during the solution, whereas the DSPC, you see this crumpling, this green, uh, crumpling and falling. We call this the rippling transition. When you increase the acyl chain length of the lipid and you go from a smooth dissolution to a rippling dissolution, Call that the wrinkling transition. So the wrinkling transition between C16 and C18 may explain that big jump in the half life. We also looked at oxygen permeability of the shell and showed that, um, that the defect density, as the defect density increases, the permeability increases. Remember this plot from uh, stability lectures? Okay, so, and we've also looked at Cervanta, a lung surfactor. Well, now, Cervanta has lipids, it has mainly DPC, but it has some other lipids. We look at two surfactor proteins, SPD or SPC, both of which are hydrophobic, and come out in the liquid liquid extraction phase when we take the golden bologna sort of extracts. Right? So they're both hydrophobic proteins, they have these alpha helices and these lipid residues. And they're thought to act, and these are some kind of those cartoons dramatic or significant, and they're some thought to act to kind of anchor bilayer folds into the monolayer. So that when you're expanding the lung, it enters a reservoir of liquid that can fill that space, the monolayer space. And uh, what we saw is that DPPC is a big spherical during the solution, but the surveillance that crumples the folds, and as it, as it decreases in size, and see it quickly in the And indeed, we saw a big jump between pure DPPC and the in the circulation persistence. So, this frequently transition seems to be um, valid. It works both in vitro and in vivo. So, it kind of explains this initial jump between DPPC and the SPC. It's this is kind of the step increase in the rigidity of the shell. But how do we explain this drop? I mean, we're going from a shorter chain to a longer chain. We would expect we expect this tra this trend to continue going upward. Well, that could probably be explained by phase separation. So C twenty four is not the only component of the lipid. We also have pegrid, and the peg li the lipid from the pegrid is C eighteen here. So if you have C twenty four plus C eighteen. There could be phase separation, lateral phase separation on the lipid shell that is leading to this kind of microstructure that's caught very stable. In fact, there's a rule of thumb that you get what's called hydrophobic mismatch, where you have crystal chains on lipids that are greater than a difference of four. Right? And so we go from 18 to 24, that's a difference of six. So we're getting a six carbon difference. That's a hydrophobic mismatch. We expect them to face it. This is one of these untold, uh, well, it's really well known in the lipid literature. For those who study supported membranes and those who study lipizones, but um, it, you know, now we're seeing it happen to bubbles too. Right? So again, microphase separation where the pegylated lipid space separates, the pegylated lipid having a lower a lower persistence because, because of, uh, of giving it a lower persistence because of that separation. This has also been seen in Langer monolayers where, uh, where they looked at uh, Langer monolayers of lung surfactants and lung surfactant proteins, and they see that uh, you get this stress, this, this stiffening. Uh, that, that can happen uh, that's due to what they call micro-phase separation. It's really, really small. 
So probably in the case of the C24 and the C18, it's it's not it's, it's forming completely separate from the base. Rather than the other cases where there may be phase separation, but there's little micro, little small, actually nano membranes within the fluid phase layer that are combined as well. So this is again, just going back to half-life minutes versus the carbon basic chain length. And instead of on a log scale, applying on a linear scale, so you get a better sense of how big the difference is. So we see a big jump from C16 to C18 because of the spring flow transition. Big flow and JD. And we're seeing again a big jump to C22, but then we drop to C24. So this is increasing Van der Waals cohesion, which makes sense. And that's what the model showed before, increasing the elasticity of the home base chains. But then you're getting a hydrophobic mismatch uh, that leads to complete phase separation and loss of the home base chain. So it seems that ideally C22 would be a good limited C20 or C22. Give you, just to give you a sense, um, this is the radio intensity as a function of time on a log scale. Now, time is on the log scale for C16 versus C22. And you're getting much better persistence and area than the curve for C22. Bubbles are the same size now, but the shelf is definitely stiffer and you're getting much better separation. So, this is Probably this is not the best bubble formulation that's ever been made, of course not. Because you, you guys will probably make better formulations. But the point of this is just that you can engineer a cell and it does have an effect. And your colleagues that are electrical engineers and medical physicians will probably not believe it until you show them. Okay? So don't be afraid to engineer your bubble shells and do these types of experiments to demonstrate that you can get better, longer persistence. Stronger contrast, better, better application, better, better performance. Let's say. Yeah. Oh, to get the video intensity, we use MATLAB, uh, but often the so many of the imaging systems like the Vivo Visual Sonic System has their own software that they, they use to draw a region of interest. But you don't need to do that. But we got these with a, a Siemens Sequoia, which is a, um, a probe that's available. Uh, it's a it's a clinical probe for humans, and it's uh, we got a refurbished one for like fifteen k, which sounds like a lot for an imaging system. That's not bad, and it came with the contrast enhancer. And we got it on this uh, small parts type transducer uh, probe, so that we can image you know higher resolution. And um, with the CPS, yes, and, um, and so we would get those images, and then we would we were basically getting movies from that, and then we would take those movies, convert them to stacks of MATLAB, and then analyze them. Even if you don't want to use MATLAB, you can still use like ImageJ, which is free software, and that will work as well. So you just need to draw a region of interest, and then uh, and then you will type you can use that same region of interest in subsequent frames and calculate. Intensity within that region, the pixel intensity within the region that's required. And then the, the model, it's easy to, then once you have, uh, sorry, going forward, once you have this, this curve, the data, then you can easily get the curve to the width of each square, each square information. It's just that you have an exponential that's feeding in, 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 the, in the contrast, and then you have an exponential that's feeding out the contrast. And, uh, so it's a really simple uh, equation that fits in there. So, so that's pretty straightforward to do. It's just a single component on the different layer model. So, any questions on that? I have some videos if you don't want to do this. It's like a lecture, so it's not worse. Um, okay, so we talked about imaging. Now we're going to talk about drug delivery. Uh, these things are not mutually exclusive. The best ideal situation would be imaging and doing delivery. But uh, 
We'll start with we'll, we'll sort of break the two topics up. Dose at which 50% of the 
percent of the patients have a positive effect. And then there is the toxic dose of the TB. And animals sometimes use the L dose for lethal dose. But in humans, obviously, not. So the, the toxic dose 50 is you take 50% of the dead experience the toxic dose, you find out the concentration of this guy takes place, and that's your TB. But the therapeutic index is defined as a TB50 over an ED50. So it's a universal value, it's a ratio. And just look at, just think about what happens here. If your TB50 increases, that means it, re, it shifts this curve to the right. That means it requires more dose to get a toxic effect. If your TB50 decreases, then that shifts this curve to the left. Therefore, it's more effective. And the whole point of drug delivery is to increase the therapeutic index by increasing the effective dose, by decreasing the effective dose, increasing the toxic dose. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, another important thing in pharmaco, pharma, is the pharmacology of the drug, the pharmacokinetics. And so it's good to basically understand some basic ideas of the so called pharmacokinetic modeling. You have one component, it's the blood, that's what you're injecting into. You have another component, I'm going to talk about blood brain barrier over here, but this could be tumor back, this could be tumor, tissue, or some other tissue that you're trying to put in. Okay, and this is, so you have a concentration of drug in component one, that's just a blood in concentration of component one. You have a second component, concentration of drug in the second component, so you, you have a transfer coefficient between one and two, and a reverse transfer coefficient that back to one. Right? And then you have an elimination concept. So what's found in the blood can get filtered out through the kidney. The kidney takes a lot of small molecules out of circulation. Um, the blood, the spleen, the liver take larger particles out of circulation. Um, the liver takes a lot of you know, debris and, and uh, waste material out of circulation. They eliminate. Also, the little bit bubbles, you eliminate the gas in the lung, and so on. And <clears throat> you can imagine that these are, you can do a mass balance, and you have these sort of ordinary differential equations that are coupled that come about. So you have the concentration of, of drug in component one, you have the concentration, and that's this equation. So the accumulation. Is what comes in minus what comes out. What comes in is what comes in from component two, and what comes out to component two and to the elimination. Right? Same with component two. That what comes in, what accumulates in component two, is what comes in through component one, and then what comes out through component two. Right? This is a simple pharmacodynamic model. It gets more and more complex. You can have elimination here and elimination here. And you can even have another component, or another component after that. So it gets more and more complex. And every time you add a component, you add more differential equations that are all coupled together, and you make it more difficult to model, but it's still possible. Chemical engineers are, this is right in our wheelhouse, so we're good at this. <laughs> um, but the main thing is, the idea of drug delivery, is you want to increase this, this transfer between the blood and the tissue. That's what we're trying to do with blood right? So in terms of therapeutic index, you want to get a sense of it, but really mechanistically what we're trying to do is increase the transport between the blood and the tissue. So for example, we have blood on one side, and this is the blood brain barrier, and the brain on the other side, and we have the transport coefficient times the concentration. It indicates the diffusion Flux into the brain, we have the concentration, the transport coefficient of the concentration in the brain that determines the flux back into the blood. The total flux is the concentration, the net flux is the, is the transport coefficient times the difference of concentrations. And then the accumulation is this transport, the flux times the error. So the idea with microvolts is to increase the transport coefficient and the, 
in rural, really area, you create you don't have much of an impact on it. That's this is what this is dictated by biology. In the brain, it turns out the surface area is only like 15 to 20 meters squared. That's a lot of surface area. The problem with the bell brain barrier, as you'll see, is that that transfer coefficient goes to zero for any molecule that's larger than a small molecule. Basically, proteins, um, uh, antibodies, um, plasma, uh, DNA can't get through that bell brain barrier. So this is a movie I've learned in Italy. So here's the region of interest. And watch, we're going to start destroying those bubbles within that region. Um, actually, it's hard to see it on vivo. It's easier to see it on the contrast mode. Um, so you can see the bubbles are being cleared from the tumor region now because the food is black. So initially, we have bubbles. So they came to this market. So initially there's bubbles here, you can see them, and then they're being destroyed and put through the tumor. That, that's an increase in trust that we're actually delivering the drug. And you get a spatial temporal profile of the drug delivery by looking at the tumor. So you can see there's a lot more bubbles up on top here. Because the tumor is poorly diffused, so we're getting a lot more drug delivery on these edges here. So let's just know the cause of it, which guy is drug delivery. You get a better sense of the distribution of the drug. It's going to, of course, follow the, the contract. Okay, so I wanted to also show you hopefully what really motivates you to take this tumor without even worrying. And that's a paper that just came out last, uh, now two years ago, a little over a year ago, um, in the Journal of Control Release, which is a drug delivery journal. And 
He was given by a very multidisciplinary team here in you know, well, not here, but in Norway. Okay? But just look at it. It's fun to look at it. These the, the types of, of the projects that are collaborating. So focus in on the gastroenterology. That's the GI tract, right? A clinical medicine, clinical biochemistry, surgical sciences, clinical sciences, cancer biology. Internal medicine, radiology, pathology, or pathology, oncology, uh, some fundamental research, research and bioengineering. What's missing is chemical engineering because they used uh, over the counter uh, commercial contracts for that. Um, as one point of person I'll point out in the bubble field uh, is Michel Pistin. So he was originally leader of the Young's group in, in, in the Netherlands, and he had been collaborating with the Norwegian group on this project. And the project is a human clinical trial using ultrasound and micro levels to enhance gemcitabine treatment of inoperable pancreatic cancer. So I don't know what the status of pancreatic cancer is in India, but in the United States and Europe, it's a significant problem. It's, it's a very poor prognosis. A very high death rate within two to three years of the prognosis, of the diagnosis. Um, so it's a very problematic cancer. There's not a lot of good treatments out there that are available. And so it's one of those cancers that people are trying to focus on trying to there's other kinds of cancers like breast cancer and prostate cancer that are more prevalent, but they also have more successful treatments typically. Uh, but pancreatic cancer is one of those that, like brain cancer, is very, very difficult to treat. So they, this is a human clinical trial. And so they have, um, they tell you the average age, gender, body mass index, et cetera, on these on these uh, patients. Okay? And the basic idea was this. They were using gemcitabine, which is this, that at that time was the standard of care for uh, pancreatic cancer in Norway. And there, it's an over-the-counter, it's, over it's not over-the-counter, it's a prescribed drug, but it's, um, it's delivered intravenously. And so the concept is, well, we know that there's a problem with this drug getting into the pancreatic tumor. So can we use ultrasound and bubbles, i.e. some operation, to facilitate the drug transport into the tumor? So what they do is they first in infuse the drug. Okay? So for about 30 minutes, they're just infusing the drug. And they're also doing some imaging just to make sure that the probe is over the region that they want to do. And they're not even sonicating the entire three-dimensional volume of the tumor. They're just giving a slice. We were talking about this in the problem with imaging is, is you're just giving a slice, you're not getting three-dimensional. Um, so there are approaches that are being implemented now and, and, uh, and are, are under research and development to do 3D to run those two. So 2D slice through the tumor. They find the, the largest cross section of the tumor and that's what they use. Okay, so they, there's no bubbles, but then here they start injecting bubbles, they do an injection of bubbles, and then they're going to do these, um, these multiple injections for the next 30 minutes. So this shows you they use this GG Logic 9 uh, ultrasound scanner. They have a scan bed, it's a porous and probe. It's curved, which means it has a, uh, since it's got a convex uh, shape, it means it, it tends to spread the ultrasound waves more and get them to some part of the body to do. And they're focusing on the pancreas, the pancreatic cancer. Um, now, there's a real patient here, and then there's like a cartoon here. So just that's it's kind of confusing. If you look at this for the first time, it just looks like oh, it's burning the tissue, but it's, it's really, this is a cartoon. Okay? 
So this is kind of a, a cutout of, okay, here's a cancer and this is what we're trying to report. These are some of the images that can be acquired from the tumors to give you a sense of the size of the tumors. They have a bunch of different sizes, um, different uh, lengths, and, and height, and width of the tumors, and they profile that registration of which one, two, three, seven, which one, two, four, seven. Okay, and so they're doing this procedure and they document all the potential adverse events that happen. And these are the different types of events that happen. And they don't, um, uh, regardless of the severity, they're, so the plot is regard, regardless of the severity of the grade, meaning if you feel a little bit of abdominal pain or a lot of abdominal pain, it just scores and it, they tell the time. Um, or direct correlation to the treatment. Of course, in, in many cases, when people have cancer, they're feeling abdominal pain. That's why they came up with the position in the first place. So you have abdominal pain, number one, nausea, fever, uh, neutropenia, this is um, white cell, count is down. Which makes sense for a uh, chemotherapeutic drug. Uh, fatigue, constipation, etc. I mean, what you're seeing, I think it's sort of the standard, the standard kind of symptoms that you're presenting with a patient that's got cancer and you're giving them chemotherapy. I mean, you don't see here as any ma ma major negative effects. So it's not that the bubbles are causing any kind of This shows the data, and as you can see, there's a large of interpatient variability of the data. Uh, the red and the yellow are patients where the tumor size was seen to increase. And this is the standard of assessing whether a tumor therapy is, is effective or not, is to measure the size of the tumor. Um, again, molecular imaging is probably a better readout, right? But right now, it's not yet implemented in the, in the clinic because of the inability to quantify. And that's not only the case for ultrasound, it's also the case for MRI. In Boulder, we have NIST. NIST has a group that is looking at quantification of MRI, and it's a big challenge for them that we come to. It's not just us, but it's not just ultrasound. But the point is that there's a lot of variability. So one, two, three, four of these patients are seen, even with therapy, they're seen with human growth. It's not unusual. There's a number of patients that you see also that you see a, a decrease in tumor size, which is a clear evidence of the test. But what is most critical is that the patients with little stars are, because these are the patients who their tumor actually shrunk enough where it was now of a size that was sufficiently small to warrant a surgical uh, removal of the tumor, which is a curative so these patients were actually removed from the study because they had seen a positive benefit to the point where they could move into a different treatment room, which was really exciting. That's, that's what you really want, right? You want to move all these, you have know, patients that are inoperable, you want to move them all to the operable stage. Um, this shows the number of cycles that were given of therapy. So there's some information there was a significant increase in the number of cycles of therapy. That means that the patients were still healthy enough to warrant continued therapy with therapy. Right? So there's a point at which the patient is suffering so badly, they're not improving, and so you eventually stop the therapy altogether. So the fact that, first of all, number one, to improve the number of cycles. But this, this is what I found really exciting. This is uh, cell operation versus the drug alone. So this is here's the drug plus ultrasound and bubbles versus drug alone. And there's a doubling, so twice as high, a doubling of the survival time um, of the patients. And these were the patients that were removed from the study that so some of them could go on therapy with them. So even though those who could who didn't have a significant enough tumor shrinkage for operation, um, they still don't have the life care. And so that's a kind of significant increase. And so there's a lot of interest now in pursuing this um, further to try to maybe implement this more in the cancer therapy. Uh, 
it shows number of treatment cycles, there's survival, and really, this one is really exciting. This is a patient who's still alive at the end of the study. And basically, and this shows some of the signals. So um, there's the pancreas here. This is the ultrasound image in view mode image and contrast and first ultrasound image. So the pancreas is here, and the tumor is here, and the aorta is here. This aorta is a reason, big reason why you don't do the surgery, because you've got a lot of blood flow right next to the tumor, so you can't just chop out that tumor and you have to wait for the aorta. So, if you look at that contrast intensity as a function of time, so here it's baseline and you lower it that you. So the aorta increases right away, there's a little bit of a delay, but almost hardly into the pancreas and especially into the tumor. So this was evidence that, um, that you know, the bulge are getting the tumor, the bulge are getting the ultrasound, and you're seeing a positive effect. So a very positive um, result. So I'm going to go and focus on some of the studies that might be done um, in the more recent times. One is in vitro cell operation. So you can try to deliver things in vivo, and you can also try to deliver things in vitro. That is the cells, suspended cells, right? Here for bioengineering applications. This would be uh, something that you do instead of electroporation. The idea of in vitro cell operation is you have a bubble and it expands and contracts with the acoustic wave, and those oscillations and expansion and contraction can lead to a phenomenon called jetting. So, jetting can occur because you have this boundary here that leads to an asymmetry in the, in the flow of the fluid that leads to a recirculation of the fluid through the bubble in what's called an involuted jet. And that jet um, can be quite strong. And this is why cavitation can break apart ship propellers and water hose and you know, can work to clean your teeth and so forth. So it can be quite a strong water jet that can permeate the cell. And you want it to be a transient permeation, right? You want it to be a permeation that you want to create a hole so that the drug can get in, but the cell has to be able to repair that. There's also the oscillation of the, of the bubble with the shear forces and contact forces that can potentially be causing a, a port for the, or in the, the cell membrane. So we got interested in, in this problem in particular because we had, we saw this paper that came out of Mark Krause's group at Georgia Tech in 2012. And in that study, he says that, that ultrasound is inefficient. As a celebration method. And he said, he based it because he said, we did a lot of studies on cell operation, and we were able to get up, uptake efficiency up to 80%. However, those were the only the cells, 80% of the cells that were still alive. If we go back and we look at the total number of cells that we started with, some of those cells were killed or lysed during the procedure. So if we look at the uptake efficiency versus total number of cells that we started with, then everything drops to below, and that's the white markers here in the open circles, in the open um, diamonds, falls below 50%. So inefficient, right? So that really threw the gauntlet for us, and we wanted to take it along and see if we could do 50%. So I had a graduate student, uh, Congo Song, who finished up the study. Uh, published in the Diagnostics in 2015. And he designed a cartridge that would fit into this bracket, that would fit into a, a, uh, a bath. And on one end of the bath, you have a transmute, so on the other end, you have a rubber acoustic um, absorber. And it was also, in this water bath, there was an immersion here to keep it warm down to 37. You have to have a water bath because you need an acoustic coupler. Ultrasound rays will travel through air. The, uh, trans the ultrasound transducer was a therapy transducer that was used, that's used on the joints when you want to prevent joint pain. And it's one of the things that you can do with the technical tool that you can put 
years of the report. And uh, so inside the, 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 the cartridge, there's a clear, acoustically transparent membrane on both sides, and inside there's a screw bar to keep all the cells and bubbles mixed together during the sonication. And then, of course, it caps it. And, uh, and the nice thing is it's high throughput, so you can put in the cells and bubbles, sonically, kick them out, put in new cells and bubbles, or just put in more bubbles, etc. And of course, uh, being the labs that we are using the size selection techniques, we can now look at the effect of different sizes. So 3.2 microns, 25 microns, 16 microns. So the first thing that we want to do is get the stability in the sonication tool. And what we know is that the one to two micron bubbles will obliterate it very quickly in the sonication tool. Well, faster than five seconds. The 45 survived a little bit, but the 68 microns were much more stable. This, this little schematic shows you kind of the difference between the bigs and the little big bubbles and little bubbles. If you take uh, the concentration of the function of time and you fit a, a uh, exponential to it, then you get the half life. So these are the concentrations of 6 microns, 4 microns, and 2 microns. And that's a large scale. We also collaborated with, uh, with a uh, Fluid mechanics person who, who uh, simulated the bubble response to both uh, pulses for the two micron bubble, four micron bubble, and six micron bubble. And these are the uh, relative expansion. So that's the radius divided by the initial radius. And the two micron bubble expands all the way to six times its initial radius. The four micron bubble goes to four times its initial radius. And the six micron bubble only goes to about three times its initial radius. It's this high amount of expansion that leads to bubble destruction. Okay? So these are this is why these two micron bubbles are destroyed. They can't they cannot survive this first expansion, compression, and expansion. They start to fragment. So this is they don't ever get to experience the rest of these oscillations. With the four micron bubbles, you're right on the verge where at four times the initial so many of these bubbles, you know, a fraction of them are <coughs> destroyed, but there's still a fraction of them that survive. Whereas the six micron bubbles, most of them survive and recycle. You can take these RT curves, radius time curves, and you can get a normalized power and dissipation of the pure viscous forces through this um, equation. It's a it's a it's an integration of the radius. The normalized radius at each point, time point minus one, and that number is squared, and then you integrate that over time, and then you divide by the total time because you're integrating from zero to t. So it's an integrated out of time. And from this power, you can get you can get power, or and maybe by this power you can multiply power by time to get energy. And so this is the power, it goes, it, it decreases with bubble diameter, but energy increases with bubble diameter. Energy increases with bubble diameter because more bubbles are surviving. The larger bubbles survive, so they survive for more oscillations. So even though the instantaneous power is higher for the small bubble, the overall energy delivery is higher for the large bubble because it's more persistent. So it's like death by a thousand cuts. Um, so you have a uh, single side operation. This is the number dead, this is the number treated. The two micron bubbles don't do so great. They kill it, they, well, they do pretty well, I guess. They do great, sorry. They do, really great. <laughs> they do they treat a lot of bubbles, or a lot of cells, and you get some dead, but mainly most of them are treated. With the four microns and six microns, you're increasing the number of dead cells. You're not really increasing the total number of treated cells. Okay? It's the number of treated cells. So you get the best effect here. What that is indicating to us is that higher power and lower energy bursts, bursts of higher power, is more efficient because it allows the, the cells to survive. Now, we're not quite over that 50% mark when we improve the dead cells. So what we did was we said, well, let's go back and we'll, we'll cheat a little bit and give them two sonications. 
when you do one summit case run, and we almost get to 50%. And this actually includes not only uh, treated and dead, which are always, which are treated, treated, dead, and untreated, which are always the case, and also the last cells. And these were the cells that Mark Crosby was putting before the tech work planning about. And we weren't taking these into account. But when we were taking them into account, we were up to about 50%. So we've already kind of gotten up to that threshold, but we wanted to overcome it. So we did a second cell operation, and the number of treated cells now are way over 50%. We treated, we said, how far can we get? So we treated them again, but oh, we've lost, we've lost a lot. We get more dead cells. So these cells can only survive a certain number of cell locations, and then they start to die, right? And it makes sense. You're punching holes in the, in the cells, and it only takes so much. And the fourth is even worse. So it looks like two cell operations with the small bubbles is most effective. We also did, had some fun. We said, let's sonicate, let's do two cell operations, but we'll do one with green and one with red. And let's see what happens. And we, and we delivered multiple drugs in sequence via cell operation. <laughs> the answer is yes. We, you know, the first cell operation, you get about 50% green. On the second cell operation, you get about 50% red. And then, so you get 25, 25, 25, 25 green, 25 red, and 25 purple. So you can get uh, fractional cells that have both of those elements in the middle. So you can do sequential sonications and you can deliver multiple drugs in sequence. So we wondered if this was going to hold also for low grade variability. The smaller bubbles work over multiple. Um, some equations, does that work better? It does work very good. Does that work as well? We need more than those in the user. So let me tell you a little bit about the low grade barrier. This is a, a model of the vasculature of the brain. You can see it's highly vascularized. This is uh, what these capillary vessels look like. They're short segments that come together and branch. It's kind of a network. They're not like really long capillaries. Okay? They're short segments, and the neurons go right next to those. And so the human brain is about 1.5 kilograms, right? and about, uh, about 1,200 cubic centimeters or millimeters of volume. Within that brain is about 100 billion neurons. The capillary volume is about percent of the total volume of the brain. The microvascular area is about 100 centimeters squared per gram. That's a huge amount of surface area. The distance between capillaries on average is about 40 microns. And usually there's a neuron right next to a capillary. The capillary diameter is on the order of 7 to 10 microns. And the neuron is only, yeah, so each neuron is only about 20 microns away from the capillary. So this is a, a view of a neurovascular junction. You have the vessel, you have these parasites, and then you have these neuro, neuro, neurons that surround it. And the idea with blood brain variability was to get blood into the brain that can only keep it in blood brain barrier. So the blood brain barrier looks like this. You have we have a neuron, neural systems here, and then we have, well, first of all, the lumen of the vessel here. Okay, so you want to get it from here to here. Uh, but around the vessel is the endothelium, is an endothelium cell that has a tight junction. And then around that is the basal membrane and then the parasites and astrocytes. Uh, what really is, is problematic is this blood brain barrier, which is this tight junction with adherins and cadherins that are pulling the membranes and fluid waste cells together and locking them together. You can kind of see this is what it looks like with the molecular scales, the protein schematics, the molecular scales. So, unless you do something with blood brain barrier, only get passive transport, and that will include only molecules that are 
less than 500 volts. That's a pretty small molecule. Also, molecules that have a partition coefficient that's oxygenicated, bottom partition coefficient on the order of two to four. And less than, in other words, with the filler. Or less than 500 in bottom line, don't want to do this. And that includes small, small gas molecules. Small organics like barbiturates, ethanol, and caffeine recognize those are all uh, main ingredients of certain, certain things humans do. And these are kind of what the molecules look like. So there's oxygen and um, some different uh, ethanol and caffeine. So these molecules can get through to the brain, but the therapeutic molecules are the one we use humans. So, for example, this is a uh, Brain drives on the fact that I have BDMF. BDMF has been shown in vitro to regenerate neurons. So this would be great for Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis, other neurodegenerative diseases. <coughs> However, it's large, it's 14,000 volts or 14 kilovolts, it's very hard to fill it. So it doesn't get through the blood brain barrier. Another example is glial cell derived from the GBMF is even bigger at 30,000 volts, again, hard to fill it. It's not going to get through the blood brain barrier. So, there was a lot of research intensity a, a decade ago and more looking into using GBMF and GBMF. We so had regrown neurons in vitro. Investors spent millions of dollars to, put these, to, to get these things into human clinical trials, and they failed. Why? Because of the blood brain barrier. So this is not a joke, but this is a real deal. There are patients who are waiting for a drug, and there are drugs that are available that could work, but they can't work because they can't get to the region where they need to go. There's also a lot of interest in gene therapy, and one of the main things being used in gene therapy is plasma DNA. This is a DNA killer from bacteria, circular DNA, and now, humans are really good at technology, but really good at engineering these plasmas to carry genes, to be promoted only by certain cells under certain states, etc. But these plasmas are huge, they're, they're very large, but they can't get through the blood brain barrier. Another form of gene therapy is adeno associated viruses or viral gene delivery. Um, these guys can, can compact DNA into a very tight space, and they have certain proteins that help facilitate their docking to a cell and uptake into a cell, okay? But they're too big at 22 nanometers to get through the blood brain barrier. Actually, that's one of the reasons we have the blood brain barrier. We don't want, we don't want the blood, the brain neurons to get uh, infected. So, that hasn't stopped uh, researchers from trying to get it to work, so, AAV2, the associated virus 2, with GGNF, that real cell derived from the factor, could advance Parkinson's disease. If you go to uh, clinicaltrials.gov, you can read about this study that's ongoing. It includes bilateral, cat bilateral catheters, that we place surgically through the skull and into the brain, and the vector will be delivered by conventional enhanced delivery to both. To both the tumor, uh, sorry, uh, 450 microliters per hemisphere of 24 patients with advanced Parkinson's disease. So, I just wanted to point out surgically through the skull and into the brain. So, this is infection enhanced delivery. We have a cannula catheter that comes in. This is the different types of designs that you have. And the idea is to force fluid in and out to enhance convection to get the drug into the brain. This is what it looks like. Um, this is the detection of cancer in the brain. So it involves a direct craniotomy um, to create a hole in the skull to access the brain. The puncture of the neuro to protect the brain from infection. And 
that when this procedure is being done, uh, it is targeting the pupillary, which is somewhere in the interior of the brain. Yes. So, like, that it is being pierced through the cortex, so yes. that causes the problem. Yes. That will be an issue. That's going to be. This is a, a, a picture of a, a needle trap we got this from our covers at my age. Um, we transfected a brain with AAV, this is a rat brain. And um, they, before they worked with us, they did a lot of these intracranial injections. And uh, this is a needle trap that's left behind. With this successful transfection of the brain, you get a, you even get a passage across the corpus callosum into the hemisphere. But the needle trap is so prevalent up here. Um, and, um, you know, I just think it's really important to keep in mind what I just talked about. To hear this bickering about sterile information. Um, just remember that this is the state of the art. And to me, this is part of it. You're cutting a hole in the skull, which was, you know, we have archaeological evidence that this is basically the same treatment that they for like 5,000 years. Right? Oh, we have a brain disorder, let's cut a hole in the skull and then try to put something in there. Um, it just, it's, it's just not, it's just not the best way, it seems to me, right? Like, we can do better than this. I mean, even if there's a sterile inflammatory response that leads to a bit of inflammation, it seems to me that we should have just thrown the baby out with the bathwater. So, uh, focused ultrasound for the brain involves, is pretty high tech, it involves these uh, parabolic arrays that are quite expensive, they have hundreds or thousands of array elements. There's a CT scan that's taken uh, to account for the explosion of pressures in the skull so that we can think of ways to propagate and focus on a single point of the brain. Tomorrow I'm going to show you a pic, uh, video from a TED talk in which they demonstrate this. It's not with others, but they demonstrate the technology. It can be done with MRI. MRI is a, is, can be used to, um, to image the temperature map of the brain, and a uh, focused ultrasound can be used to heat the brain, even just with one degree Celsius difference. It's not damaging to the brain, but it can be detected with MRI to locate the point of the focus, uh, focus of the ultrasound. So you can you can focus, you can pre-plan with the CT image uh, where your focus should be, how to train, how to train your uh, elements to get the focus to the region that you're interested in, and you can double check to make sure you're on target before any therapy is done. This is a complete, the patient is awake during this procedure and has a pill switch for the whole week. So you'll see tomorrow, it's quite a more. So now, um, well, focus focus, this, this so-called focus focus set of surgery without bubbles is currently being used to treat uh, Alzheimer's disease and brain cancer. In fact, bubbles are being used here. Brain tumors, they need to be denied. Uh, but also, without bubbles, depression, epilepsy, essential tremor, neuropathic pain, uh, attention, what is it, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, which probably everybody in this room has been all scientists, so they always hear So just precise. Okay. It's a joke. <laughs> um, Parkinson's disease, early stage research, ALS, uh, stroke, traumatic brain injury, multiple sclerosis. So a lot of different potential applications.
Bubbles are set in vibration at the same frequency as the other sound beam and are Mm -hmm. 
also be used for Alzheimer's disease. In the wake of this new Alzheimer's disease, we see clusters of toxic unmedicated plants growing up between nerve cells and neurons. And inside the neurons, tau proteins clumping together, causing cell death. Ideally, we can use drugs to remove this toxic buildup, in turn, reversing the cognitive damage. But this drug delivery is helpful by the blood brain barrier which acts as a strong shield, stopping drugs from penetrating to where they're needed. The work that Professor Watson's lab involves using ultrasound to deliver a treatment through the blood brain barrier, and has been shown to work in mice. This is how it would work in humans. First, the patient is injected with blood levels. of these micro bubbles and ultrasound exerts mechanical forces on blood vessels and temporarily opens the blood brain barrier. This then allows drugs and antibodies to reach our little parts and our tables and ultimately clear them. What's more, the research at the Queensland Brain Institute has shown that ultrasound alone clears the blood and tangles. Before drugs are even administered. This work has the greatest effect in reversing one of the most pressing health issues in a rapidly aging society. Alzheimer's patient was just recently completed this year. Okay. Uh, what are the effects of Alzheimer's? <clears throat> so, we wanted to look at uh, in vivo cell operation. So, we know that we have the brain and we apply ultrasound to the original metrics. The bubbles interact with the ultrasound, open the endothelium, and allow drugs to get into the part of the body where the tissue of the brain is increasing the balance. So, we're about uh, up to the even though so it's still at the small animal scale. Um, this is a work that was done in collaboration with NIH. Um, with NIDA, Brain and Barbie with the NIDA National Institutes of Drug Use. And um, here we, uh, we have a, a rat and we're focusing ultrasound into the striatum on uh, one side of the rat. And we uh, take the right and so the bubbles are, well, here's the setup again. There's an acoustic coupling so that we can, you know, properly focus the ultrasound. There is a <coughs> bars and the tissue. It's really important to make sure they're all targeted. And so there's a 2% evidence blue dye. That dye is used because we're using it as a, as a model drug, something that we can detect that doesn't normally get to the blood brain barrier. And micro bubbles are injected. At time zero, we sonitate the right hemisphere for five minutes, then we sonitate the left hemisphere for five minutes. And at 10 minutes, the dye is sacrificed, the tissue is removed, then the brain is removed, the section of the ribosome, and then into the glycolic region. 
So if you think hard about brain sections, I recommend you merge your eyes. But this is uh, basically the idea. We're all target the center of the spider, the right spider, and then the left spider. Um, we're positioning the enthragma, and there's five, one through five slides to take it uh, through the Sizes. We only tried two microns and bigger bubbles, about six microns, and different concentrations, 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 8th. You can see here um, Evans Blue died uh, getting out of the, of, into the brain for a different way. Okay, so, so here's two microns, this is spot right there, and the third um, but it's more conspicuous in the six microns. The light bar is better than just your eye and visualizing uh, the Evans Blue because it can use infrared. And the Evans Blue dye actually works a little bit away, so you can take advantage of that. But here's the same brain substance. No Evans Blue without bubbles, um, but we did Evans Blue with bubbles for two and six microns. And you can see that nice spot here in particular, two microns. So it is being affected. Six micron would be much more effective, even at a lower order of magnitude, lower concentration. So, the first part was just to make sure you're on target. So, you take the center of the brain, you, need, you, you expect that the, the, the center of the brain will have the spot, and then you can move away from that and move the slice away in one direction or the other direction, that you'll, you're going to see reductions in the intensity of the dot. That's the actual fact that we're seeing. These are the air bars that show that. So the beam is effective to on target, so you're consistently on target. So that was a really major accomplishment in and of itself, just to make sure that you're always on target. Um, and then we did a dose response study, so every blue concentration versus the total fluorescence, and we see a nice linear correlation like you expect to see, okay? So concentration versus volume dose, or concentration, um, so as you might expect, the six microns are much more effective at delivering the Evans blue into the brain at a given concentration. This is the concentration given per uh, kilogram of weight, body weight. So for given weight, like for example, this at this concentration, you can see a significant increase in the amount of drug given. You know, while it's not drug, it's Evans blue, so it's a drug. So this might be what you expected, and you might say, okay, great, it's all working. I mean, it's not what you expected, but small, you expected that the small bubbles might be better based on the in vitro part, but the in vivo says, okay, the bigger bubbles are better, but that might be expected, because we saw that bigger bubbles circulate longer, they provide a strong contrast, and ultrasound imaging, so this may be not so surprising. Here's what's surprising. If you take if you take the data for both the large bubbles and the small bubbles over here, and you collapse it by total bubble volume per milliliters, that is, you take the total volume of the bubbles that you're in injecting, and you plot it by that, then the data falls to a single curve. And this is the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. It falls to a, single, it falls to a curve on both sides. And this was surprised. Okay? So, we expected this. We expected to say, okay, bubbles, larger bubbles are more efficient. But larger bubbles are also larger bubbles. They contain R to the cube, you know, it's, you know the concentration, uh, you know, let's say, we have a, one, a two micron diameter, so one micron radius bubble versus a six micron diameter or three micron radius bubble. That's a factor of two difference in radius. Three cubed is a factor of 27, uh, fact, a factor in volume. So there's a big difference in volume between a big bubble and a small bubble. And that difference, when you take into account that, you see it here. Now this was very unexpected. We expected to see that even when we normalize by volume, we would expect to see a divergence. We would expect to see a difference between large and small bubbles. Okay? And that's not what we see. This is completely contrary to the, to the current state of the, of the belief of the field that large bubbles are more efficient at delivering their So it's, it's, a, it's very
very confusing. We don't understand why that is. There are some potential explanations. Pharmacodynamics of bubbles seem to indicate that maybe it's the amount of gas that you inject. It's a, a similar type of trend is seen with the persistence of bubbles if you normalize by the volume of the wave frequency. So, so maybe what's happening. So we we came to conclude that it should be the volume dose that the, that's, that's used when you're trying bubbles of different sizes and different concentrations. And you can unify that into a single volume dose and do direct comparisons between sensors that way. So this was our this was our um, our conclusion from this video. And you see it seems that you've got a quite nice linear correlation. It kind of drops a little bit off of a much larger dose. Okay, um, so finally we went back and we did some AAV, so the Admiral Associated Virus Transfection. And we see transfection in the brain. It's not very, didn't show very nicely, but there's a spot here when we're sonicating. And there's no needle track. So that's what's really cool. There's no craniotomy, and there's no needle track. It's through the brain, intact brain, and no puncture of the dura, and no repair. So, um, in fact, we are, we are transfecting neurons. You can see the processes, uh, you know, these little lines that indicate that, in fact, the transplant is completed. So we have a way of spatially and temporally uh, delivering DNA to the brain and having it come to through the neurons in the brain. So, a bit about uh, introduction of bubbles, focus ultrasound in the clinic, in vitro sonicration in vivo, next step, pharmacokinetics, and next step, we do the AAV. Now I'll talk about some other applications. The target dopamine. This is a nice little, this is a little video of a bubble that's being hit by one pulse of one shot every two seconds, and it shows the material on the surface of the bubble being shed because of its interaction. So I'm going to tell you a bit about, do we have more time? So I'll talk today about, I'll, I'll finish up in talking about two topics, uh, polyplex microbubbles and oxygen delivery of bubbles. Two completely different topics. So one of the things we wanted to do was get away from viral gene transfection. And so the idea was to use polymers to go to, to, uh, to carry the DNA and transfect the DNA into the cell. And there's a particular polymer called PEI, which at that at the time we were studying this, and still to this day, is it's known as a transfection agent. It's got um, primary, secondary, and tertiary amines, which gives it a wide variety of key capabilities. And because of this, it's able to absorb protons over a pH range. And because it, and, and so what happens is when, when our DNA gets is endocytosed by the cell, um, the endosome turns into a lysosome and it becomes acidic and then there's enzymes that come in that, that take apart the DNA so you can't transfect the cell. But the idea here with PEI is that it has a so-called proton sponge effect. So as the cell, as the endosome, or as, as the endosome is converted into a lysosome, as it's pumping in protons, you know, proton pumps, those protons are being sucked up onto the amine groups in the PEI. And so the pH isn't changing. But for every proton, positive charge that comes in, and negatively charged ion also has to come in, positive chlorine. So chlorine ions are coming in, and then you're concentrating chlorine ions. So you get an osmotic medium that forces water to come in, pops the endosome, and then the drug gets, the DNA gets released for the DNA transported to the nucleus to transfect the cell. Okay? You see the problem with transfection? It's really large. Um, but the idea is PEI is not to potentially do it. We also pigrated the PEI to make it more, uh, less immunogenic, more stealthy. We uh, then uh, 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 dilated the peg so that we could attach it to the bubble surface. The bubble surface had malamide groups that bind to the thiol group. Um, so then we could bind the PEI and pay it onto the surface of the bubble, we then, and then it became a uh, cationic bubble. We then add the DNA to the cation, the 
DNA complexes with the PDI and forms so called polyplexins, polymer complexes with DNA that sit on the bubble surface, and then we have the DNA where the bubble. And then the DNA bubble, where the bubbles are injected intravenously, they're flowing through the vasculature, and then ultrasound is used to hit the bubble, to, to activate the bubble. The bubbles become destroyed, they, they lose the PDI, and at the same time, they open up the vasculature. So then the PGI complexes can get into the cells of, for example, here at early endosome, late endosome, and then um, uh, starts to turn into, uh, well, and this is called endosomal release, the idea of the proton sponge um, that, that causes the osmotic gradient, that causes the endosome to rupture, releasing the DNA, the polyplex, and then the DNA to DNA is transported to the nucleus where it can be. Transcribe, uh, translated and transcribed into the protein. So we were able to show successful use of the biplex in a mouse model. Um, so this is ultrasound plus the microbubbles plus the DNA versus the controls, microbubbles plus DNA, DNA only or no DNA at all. Uh, we see a huge increase in the optics, optical transition to the Cyprase, so it's a bioluminescent protein that's an organogen to the DNA that we're delivering, and we also inject cyprin, which interacts with the cyprase to form the light. Um, and so we see we see the uptake, and then you can also show that you get a good biodistribution. You don't get you get drug in the tumor, or you get um, bioluminescence in the tumor, but not in the heart. So this was very exciting, and we brought this to the NIH as a, as, a, as a grant proposal, and it got shot down. And the reason it got shot down is because um, there was concern about toxicity of PEI. So there was concern that PEI is cationic, it's uh, potentially, uh, potentially toxic, and really high doses, and so forth. So, and, and so you look into literature, and even though it's one of the most successful transfection agencies, it, transfection agents, it's also toxic. And making these two things go together. Things that are good transfection agents are also good for health or higher toxicity. So uh, we kind of gave up on this idea actually, the polyplex idea. We put it on the shelf for a little while. And we tried all kinds of different uh, non-viral vectors. We tried liposomes, we tried a number of different kinds of liposuction agents, we tried poly polyplex agents, we tried Vandermark agents. And we tried um, peptide agents. We tried everything that's on the market in the brain, and nothing works in the brain. And that's because we think it's because uh, non-viral vectors uh, get taken up by the astrocytes and the parasites in the brain, mainly probably the astrocytes. So there's an active immune system that's pulling out particles. So even if you're able to successfully get them into the brain parenchyma, it doesn't mean that the DNA is going to get into the neuron. Okay? There are GARs, uh, astrocytes, that are in the brain that are protecting the neurons. Now, the, the annual associated virus has millions of years of evolution to evade that uptake and, and to rapidly get to, to, get to uh, the bonds of the neuron Delivers cargo, and then have that cargo subsequently transcribed by, by the nucleus of the neuron. Okay. So now we're sticking with viral delivery. Even though non viral would be ideal, it's just been ineffective. Okay. So I would, I would say that this is a good challenge um, that right now, with the blood brain barrier opening, we can get DNA into the brain, but how do we get it into the brain for non viral delivery successfully transcribed? That's that's a real challenge, and it's not. A, it, you won't see it in the literature right now. Like there are people who are being claimed that transfection is in vivo, but we've tried these techniques and they've been unsuccessful. And uh, so I, I think that this is a major area for, for research. Okay, I'm going to end it with a final, completely different application of microbubbles, peritoneal oxygenation. So we can make oxygen bubbles, now that we make a lot of oxygen bubbles. You need a lot of oxygen bubbles because you need a lot of oxygen. 
in this case, we use a reactor and we generate millimeter quantities per minute of, of volume of, uh, of oxygen bubbles. We collect them from the foam in a giant syringe, or a giant column, location column, collect them in the syringe, centrifuge them, concentrate them, and uh, pull them together. So this is a the OMBs, just like any other micro bubble, are discrete spherical particles. Um, but you can make large quantities, you can make meter quantities of them. And they have probably the dispersed size distribution, but we don't worry about that right now for, for lots of other reasons. As we mentioned, that intra-infrastructure has problems, but we're trying to do the, the peritoneal though. The peritoneal, um, the peritoneum is actually quite absorbed in membrane. Yeah, it's a cavity. And it's, it's surrounded by two membranes. Um, it's well surrounded by the peritoneal membrane, and um, it's the membrane that lies between the organs of the body, and then there's a skin barrier here. So there's a cavity here that can't be filled, and um, we can fill this with oxygen microbubbles. And the idea is that oxygen can diffuse through the mesothelium, the submesothelial layer, to the capillaries, and deliver oxygen to the systemic. The, uh, the use of the peritoneal cavity is not new. Um, there's other. There's actually a peritoneal dialysis, which is a method in which dialysate is given to the peritoneal cavity instead of uh, hemodialysis. And so the idea is that this is a lot easier on the patient. I love this picture because it shows somebody just just chilling in. <laughs> Look while they're doing peritoneal dialysis. Um, basically, there's a catheter that comes in. There's fresh dialysis that can be that comes in and then the spent dialysis turns out to the green diet. So it's we're actually kind of tied down with through this technology, but instead of dialyzing or adding we're starting to pull off urea and other um, toxins, we're trying to put in oxygen. So we tested this in the white rat female thorax model. So it's a it's a quarter rat, we we anesthetized the rat and function the right side of this part. And then Unlike humans, we have a more um, symmetrical bond to the lobes of our lungs are symmetrical. In the rat, they're asymmetrical. And if you come to the right side, the rat will die even if it has a left side. Uh, and so um, we injected the bubbles into the peritoneal cavity and then we measured, we measured the pressure to make sure the pressure didn't get too high in the peritoneal cavity. We measured the oxygen saturation cardiac rate, pulse ox, measure the temperature, and, uh, and then look at survival of the rats. The volume that we in injected was under 100 milliliters. Um, we did oxygen microbubbles and also saline to say the control. And this is uh, the pressure, so the number of saline is 0.2 kilopascal pressure. So we didn't pressurize, we didn't, we just extended the peritoneum, but we're not like pressurizing part of the water. But this was a striking result. We saw 100% survival in the rats treated with oxygen microbubbles up to two hours. We had to stop the treatment at this point because um, we had a non-survival study and the rats were actually giving up and off of their anesthesia and starting to wake up and regain their respiration. Um, the saline control and no treatment, they all died within about half, before half an hour. So this was literally 100% survival versus so this really surprised us. We were expecting like a 50% increase in survival time, and maybe a double in survival time we see. Mm -hmm. The heart rates in, in many cases um, dropped a little bit after the minimal thorax, but then um, went back up to that um, level. Actually, this is the maximum uh, heart rate that the pulse ox can measure. So this is kind of a, this line up here is the is the is the, is the emergency. This is a saturated oxygen, so they're up around 8 to 9 percent, um, where the, the animal that it's falling will rapidly drop by 8 to 9 percent. So, this is another area that we're using bubbles for. We're really excited about it. Um, it doesn't involve pop ultrasound, but there is a group that is doing the ultrasound free tours that we're collaborating with. Um, and so, uh, there's another looking at potential other uh, locations for the bubbles in this. And with that, I'll stop and 
there's a lot of information I know, but uh, if you have a question, just answer now. Yeah, it's question. Um, the paper in which uh, the paper was applied to the paper. Like the other patients didn't give us a present or something like that? Can I get the answer? Uh, study? Uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah, I think it was just a routine injection, just like they did gravitin, but then they added a double study. Uh, like in one of the slides, uh, like, uh, the number of efforts uh, that were shown, like yeah. long the side of the So if in those cases where they were going to decide to put the other Yeah, I, maybe, I, but I don't think that was the case. Um, we can go back to that. I think in this case, they basically not changing the protocol other than adding those Injection is that what can be done? Question? So, in the study, what can be done? Is there a difference between the science of the lady that can be done or the monitor that can be done? For the blood brain murder? Yeah, we don't know yet. It's going to probably depend on all kinds of things. The particular vessel that we're talking about, the uh, size of the bubbles, the intensity of the ultrasound. That is the peak negative pressure, the number of cycles, the pulse repetition frequency, the frequency of the mean frequency of the ultrasound, uh, the physiological stage of the of the, spec of the subject, etc. Um, there have been some studies with dextrans, but I take those with a grain of salt because dextran is a polymer, and so there's multiple ways that polymers can move through a constriction. So. Yeah, but in general, higher molecular weight, um, don't move in as quickly as lower molecular weight, but that could just be because it's a fusion through the front of them. So it's, I don't know, yeah, that's such a, yeah. but certainly these 22 nanometer adenoid associated products are going to be used for sure. And for that means the vessels, they don't take any permanent injury, the vessels, even after they allow the allow the yeah. Do they go back to the research source or is there any actual damage to the analysis? So, I mean, this is again still an area of, of, of study. Um, the studies, the initial studies were just does the blood brain barrier close or not? They would do MRI, the contrast interval, how long does it get through the blood brain barrier? And then they would inject, inject the contrast agent and see if it gets to the blood brain barrier. When they open the blood brain barrier, they see it in the front or not. Okay? And then they would. So they would do the study, they would, they would do the sonication, and they would uh, inject the gamma radium contrast agent, and see it with the MRI on the brain, and then a day later they came back and they just injected the gamma radium, but they did the MRI on the brain, and you don't see any MRI ever any signal in the T1 major in the MRI. Right, so we know that it's closed. Okay. Um, then there were some studies of the, you know, some histological studies. And they don't see a lot of uh, damage. They don't see, there's a, one group that says there's a sterile immune response, there's another group that says there's not such a sterile immune response, so there's a little bit of debate there. Uh, but they're not seeing like a lot of necrosis or anything like that. There was another set of studies done by Lisa where they were looking at human behavior and non human primates to see if it altered the behavior in a negative way. They did not see. So they, at least the initial data seems to indicate that it's safe, um, but uh, it's still an area that's open for debate. Uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is there just needs to be a lot more study. Um, but um, well, I think part of this debate between the science group and the technology group may, may facilitate that, maybe spur that. But I want to just say that even if there is damage to the inner field of some blood vessels in the brain, and even if there are some neurons at some point, it's you have to look at what the alternative is. 
facts. And the alternative is a puncture into the brain. And so, you know, I'm a little bit less, I personally less concerned about a sterile immune response than I am about a bacterial infection. Right? And, and, uh, I'm a little bit less concerned about um, some damage, some local damage to the, to the endothelium than I am about a needle trap. So these are, I think these are the issues that, you know, um, I think the, the fact of the matter is, is it's not, if you're trying to open the global end barrier, there's going to be a cost. It's just, it's just, there's going to be some side effects. But the question is, what are the current side effects and can we overcome from that? And, and ultimately, can you, can you cure or treat more disease? That's the question. I think the answer is going to be yes. Okay, other questions? In the back? So I have a basic question. Can you give some sort of an example of what we have six influence on the cell cycle phase of the pregnancy? Does it have an influence on the cell cycle phase? Because um, human phase, generally, the efficacy of the drug can be less because it is a risk. Yeah, I don't think it changes the, the cell cycle, but I don't think people will really look at that. You know, yeah. And, then, and the, the type of, I think the when you're referring to the effects of cell cell cycle, depending on the type of drug that you're trying to deliver to the cell, right? If it's a, if it's a cell that arrests cell division, or if it's a drug that arrests cell division or something like that, yeah. um, versus you know, if it's a, the resting state of the cell, maybe a drug doesn't work, but maybe an immunotherapy works, right? So because it's the cell surface markers that are immunotherapy. So. so I think it depends on the drug, right? But there hasn't been, I have, to my knowledge, I haven't seen anything that looks like affects the normal cell cycle of cells. So maybe it hasn't really been investigated in depth. Yeah. Um, we're able to transcribe neurons, and neurons are, are you know, pretty static, not static cells, but they're cells that live for a long time without the body. Um, yeah, so maybe that's, that's a good example of it. Uh, but you don't necessarily have to have a replica device itself if there's no drug in the brain. Like gene expression. Okay. Yes. It depends. I mean, it's not necessarily focused on the group that did the, the, the chemotherapy used unfocused focused Diagnostic. So it depends on the application. Yeah, I mean, you just, they, they were doing drug delivery, pancreatic tumors using them from to get to, to, to get the whole, you know, not just, not just in the tumor. I mean, it doesn't have to be that precise. You can deliver it to the, you don't even know where the tumor necessarily begins in the tissue, or ends in the tumor begins, or tissue begins, right? I mean, the margin of the tumor is often very difficult to define. So you probably want to treat a larger end than the size of what you think is the tumor. So, um, but it depends. I mean, if it's the brain, you have to have very tight, tight focusing because there's so, the, the surrounding, Tissue is critically important. These are, but these are application. I mean, these are application specific questions that have answers. I think you just have to define what my application is, what I'm trying to treat, what is the specific scenario that I'm dealing with, and do it. And this is common medical practice, right? You look at the patient, you find out what's wrong, you diagnose, you, look, you make a treatment plan for their particular case. So it's the same concept. No one size fits all. It's all. It's all. Any 
more questions? Yeah. Anything you see micro to it's not perfect. Yes. Yeah. Like I said, like, you know, as you have it's not even perfect. 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 It's not even So the first problem that's in terms of the thing, we have to pass all of this. Um, the, so, can you open a blood red nerve or fall off? Yeah. Yes. It's 25. It's really high in test field, so we get a lot of damage. Okay. So, blood red nerve, okay, the fiber bubbles is, can be done without clear damage to the area. And much, much lower ultrasound intensities. The problem with big ultrasound intensities is that you can get multiple reflections, and you know, the scroll is also a very reflective surface, so you can have some more damage. And also, the size of your Focal region increasing with the intensity of the ultrasound. So if you want to type of focus, you probably want to go with the ultrasound. But then bubbles um, can interact with all the acoustic waves you've been recording with the chances. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.